Well, good morning, Grace Street. We're so happy to have you here this morning. God delivered a beautiful day out. It's not too hot out. Uh, there's some clouds to keep the sun from beating down on us too much. And we are here together, whether we're online or in person, to hear his word this morning. We're so happy to have you join us. As we get uh, started this morning, let's start with our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 107, verse 2. And this is what the psalmist writes. He says, has the Lord redeemed you? Speak out. Tell what he has redeemed you from. Now, I hear that as almost a command. Just like when Jesus said, go out to all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching and, and discipling you. We need to speak out. We need to speak up as the church. We need to help people have that, that hope that we have, that joy that we have, to experience the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the love that we have experienced. Today, Pastor Mark, in his message, will be talking about how we can do that in the workplace. And, and I I'm not gonna give it up. I really wanted to go into what you have for your graphic for, for the title sermon, but we need to be God's light everywhere we are, and that includes in our work. So tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. We are redeemed. Thank you, Jesus, for redeeming us on the cross. Thank you, Father, for sending your son to redeem us on the cross. As we hear your word today, Father, we ask that our minds would be open, our hearts would be filled, and that we would go out with, with like marching orders to tell everyone about you, Father. Father, we just thank you, and we praise you in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Now, I, I know Mark had this after the sermon, but... I'm going to have Diane go ahead and go to that next slide. And we've got Back to Church Sunday coming on September 11th, or September 20th. September 11th, that's just the first thing that pops out when you say September. It's September 20th. It is our opportunity to invite others into our fellowship, into the church, into God's church. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had twice as many, three times as many. Or if we went and thought god size, we filled his church and that our feed crashed online because too many people were watching. Would that not be amazing? The good news is, is we record it and we put it up afterwards, so it would still be there. Let's hear what uh, the folks that put together Back to Church Sunday have to say about it. The changes brought by COVID-19 have been difficult. Our lives changed overnight as everything shut down. We were forced to deal with isolation in a way we never experienced. Suddenly, in the midst of the darkness, God showed up like he always does. Turning fear into faith, quarantine into connecting, and downtime into precious Relationships were strengthened unexpectedly. And another thing changed. People all over the world, including our friends, neighbors, co-workers, and families, became more open than ever before to hearing the gospel of hope. The pandemic shook us, but it did not crush us. We shared good times and bad times virtually. We realized what is truly important in this world. Each other. The church rose up to help those in need and to be the hands and feet of Jesus during this difficult time. We found out we are stronger together. As life returns to normal and things reopen, we'll never forget how important our relationships are and the value of spending time with loved ones in person. As we're able to gather again face to face, think of every person in your life, at every age, and 
their stage. They're waiting on an invitation to church from you. Because in every way that God connects us, we are stronger together now more than ever. I thought that little clip of video there really felt like it fit in really well with the message today as we talk about our spiritual gifts in the workplace. And the call to worship this morning that Terry read for us and, and went through uh, says, has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from, and I forgot to put the little dot, 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 the actual passage in Psalm says, your enemies. But really, what all has God redeemed you from? And you, you have to kind of fill in the dots in there and kind of fill in the blank in between. Because we each have our own story. We each have had our own personal spiritual journey. And God has released us from something. Thus the dot, dot, dot. So as we read that through, and I think I want you to really kind of think about that, tell others he has redeemed you from, and fill in the blank. But the most important thing, when we take a look at this, and we're taking a look at the church opportunity that we have to bring others into God's fold, into God's family, on the Back to Church Sunday on September 20th, is making sure we speak out and tell people about what God has done for us. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bring ourselves to you before you today. We bring our communities before you today, and we bring this church before you today. And most certainly, we bring our nation before you today. We pray for your mercies today, and we ask that you purge this land of the virus that has been attacking us. We ask that you would restore peace and calm to our nation. We ask that you would remove all fear and replace it with faith in you and in your word. Bless your people and bless this nation where we live. Let your people be a blessing to non-Christians that they will see the power of your spirit living within us. And we declare today that all strongholds over the lives of the individuals who cannot find their way to you, that they would be broken, and that they are broken in you and through your mighty power. We cast down everything that promotes itself against the knowledge of you. We know, Lord, that we are not forgotten. You know each of us by name, even the numbers of hair on our head. Father God, when we look around, all we must see is just your grace. Grace that revives, grace that restores. It restores the visions and dreams that we have for our nation, for our community, for our people, and for our lives and all our people are blessed. You are the reason we live, and we declare that our nation is blessed with every spiritual blessing. You pour out upon us these spiritual blessings for us, for our land, to heal us and to heal our land. We thank you for walking with us daily and restoring our land to a place that we can be proud of. And these mercies we call upon, and we ask for it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are stronger together in community with one another. We are stronger when we have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and with Christ. We are stronger, and the scripture tells us that there's nothing that we can't do with Christ. If Christ is living within us, there is nothing we can't do. And so when we take a look at this in the workplace in here, uh, 
we need to look back on our, on our lessons. So we go to Exodus this morning. And we're going to be going through Exodus 31, 1 through 11, if you'd like to open up your Bibles. But the old book of Exodus, uh, that Old Testament book, I should have just call it an old book, uh, contains a fascinating vignette of two craftspeople. And we talked about this Wednesday night at our study, and it's kind of different for me because uh, normally we do a sermon, and then the following Wednesday we do our study, which kind of reflects back on the sermon. But we're doing it backwards this time. So we have the study on Wednesday night, and now we get to kind of take a look back and maybe delve a little bit deeper into that work that we covered on Wednesday. So Bezalel and his assistant Ohiliab, they are remembered in the context of their work in building the tent of the meeting of the people of God. The people of Israel had been rescued from slavery in Egypt. And they had been given a covenant of law from Moses. And Moses had that covenant law handed down on Mount Sinai. And now they were instructed to go and build a tent a meeting place for God to dwell in with the people continuously. And that's a very, very important point we need to understand, is they're building this tent not for the people, but for God to be able to come down and be with the people continuously. So as we continue on. So Bezalel and Aholiab, they were giving us a very fascinating and important perspective on spiritual gifts for work in the world. How many of us have thought about the fact that we are blessed with spiritual gifts that we can use in our workplace and throughout the world? Probably never made that real connection between the two. Because we think of it as the spiritual gifts are a community-wide and fruits of the spirit that we have as an individual that we get by serving God and doing his work and will in our lives. So Bezalel and Aholiab, they give us this really neat perspective and that Bezalel is the only one in the Old Testament of whom it is said that he was filled by the Spirit of God and with the Spirit of God. So he was called upon, he was anointed by God to be able to take on and do this work. And we see in the scripture, as they call it out in there, that not only he, but God anointed the craftsmen. And he gave them special skills and special knowledge and wisdom to be able to carry out the task. And the, and the tasks are pretty daunting when you take a look at it. So we'll go into Exodus 31, 1 through 11. And it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, and grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, an expert in working with gold and silver and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. And I have personally appointed Aholiab, son of Ashimach, of the tribe of Dan, to be his assistant. Moreover, I have given special skill to all of the gifted craftsmen so they can make all the things I have commanded you to make. And then we start this list. And I want you to think about this list. Kind of keep it in the back of your mind as we go through this. The tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark's cover, the Place of Atonement, all of the furnishings of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its accessories, the incense altar, the altar of burnt offerings with all of its utensils, the wash basin with its stand, the beautifully stitched garments, the sacred garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments for his sons as they minister as priests to the people, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense for the holy place. The craftsmen must make everything as I have commanded you. Wow, now that's an assignment. That's quite a list, because if you think about this, this was a tabernacle, this was a tent, and it 
We're not talking a small pop-up tent. We're talking a tent that holds a lot of people and a lot of things that you can see in here. And it was a very, very, very special place. It was a place where God could dwell as these people moved on their journey to the promised land. So you have to understand that it wasn't something that we could just build and leave there. It had to be portable. And they had to then, I imagine, they would have to build all of the things to carry it from one place to another. So when we think about this, this is kind of a daunting task, somewhat overwhelming at times. Now, wouldn't it be nice to know that if you were given a very special assignment for the boss, that you were chosen above all the others, and you were given all the tools and knowledge to do the job, and the icing of the cake was, hey, guess what? You also get an assistant to get that job done. Now, given all that, would you begrudgingly start that job or would you kind of charge full into it? Because, man, look at all this stuff. I've been given the power and authority to do these things. I've been given all these skills. And they're just going to kind of blow and explode into that job and do the best job that they could because they would feel empowered. They would feel special. They would feel like they're part of a bigger plan highly motivated to get the job done, right? Yeah. I bet you couldn't wait to get to work in the morning. Probably singing happily or maybe whistling on your way to work. Your attitude couldn't get any better. And think about it. Once you got there, you'd be the friendliest person on the job. Because you were driven to succeed. You were empowered. You were anointed to get the job done. You would be living a life of purpose. And when you do that as a whole, you feel like your life is being fulfilled. You're living a fulfilled life. Not just a means to an end, but you're living a fulfilled life. You would have a spirit after God's own heart. The scripture tells us that Bezalel was filled with the spirit of God. So when he went home at the end of the day, that happiness and attitude, well, it would be following home, right? Just like us today. We have that great attitude. And we have that spirit of God following us home every day. So Terry kind of alluded to the picture, and hopefully you can see it up in here. But I chose this and made this graphic out of here because these are the, some of the things we may face in our workplace on a regular day. And one of them is somebody's pointing his finger at you and he's driving you down, telling you all the things you did wrong, correcting you, but probably not in a friendly, loving, humble way, not driven by you. The Spirit of God. And in the other corner, you see somebody who looks like they're totally overwhelmed. He's got his hands up in his head and he says, No, oh, I really don't know how I'm going to be able to do this. I don't know if I'm the right one to do this job. I'm not sure they picked the right person. And he's filled with self doubt and he's filled with angst and anxiety. How do you suppose? that person would feel. And then down the bottom corner over here, you can see people pointing and gossiping back and forth, pointing at someone else and gossiping about them. And gossip is usually never positive in nature, but always negative in nature. And it always serves to tear someone down rather than to build them up. So if you're faced with that type of work environment, it's going to be really, really hard to take a positive attitude along with you into your workplace. You're not going to look at coming into that job with hope, with joy. You're going to go, man, what am I up against? And then in the bottom corner over here, you see just the opposite thing. You see people joined together in unity with one another, 
happy to be working together to get the job done. So we can see the, the dichotomy of the situation between having stress and strife and everything in your job, in your workplace, and then you see joy. You see working together. You see that unity with one another, that unity of a spirit that joins together. So those are the kind of things I want you to think about today as we're talking about this story in Exodus. And we're talking about the, the overwhelming tasks that if you looked at it within your own power, you'd be overwhelmed. You wouldn't know where to start. You wouldn't know if you could get the job done. But see, that spirit of God, he anointed them. He gave them those special gifts, those special abilities to be able to go out and do that job. And it's not in Old Testament biblical times. It's today. And God gives you those abilities and gives you those same gifts today. So I'd like you to think about your job and your attitude. Does it match to that of Bezalel? Do you feel like you're part of a bigger plan, living a fulfilled life, or simply going through the motions? How's your attitude? Is it positive? Or is it positively dreadful? I mean, seriously, we've got to self-reflect on these things. Many believers feel motivated to serve God wholeheartedly in church and in church activities and in their religious activities, but lack that same passion and drive about their daily work in their life. At the same time, ours is a work oriented society. But so often the promises of work to contribute more to our lives than it does, than it can really deliver, meaning that personal fulfillment and the use of our talents to their full abilities sometimes tends to stray and way away. So a gentleman named Studs Turkle was interviewing people about their work life, and he found that for many, it was a daily humiliation. A daily humiliation. Has your job become a means to an end? And has your attitude hit rock bottom? Do you whistle happily on your way to work? Or do you go begrudgingly into that job? See. What you do when you start that day, make sure you start it with God, and that you give God that opportunity to anoint your spirit as you go forth to do that job that he has placed you in. Oh, how many of us think about it that way? That God actually placed us where we are. Huh. So maybe we need to ask about that and ask about that anointing. And I'll go into that in a moment. But see, a lot of us, it becomes a means to an end. And a means to an end is an idiom. It's used to describe something you're doing, such as work, and it's not as important as what you hope to achieve by doing it. In this case, it'd be earning money. So a means to an end means you're going to come in, you're going to do the work, but it's only just because you're doing it for your material need of money. And that's your only reason. And that's the only reason you show up every day. It's because it's a means to an end. And if you look at your job and you look at that situation, you have to understand that whoever says that, that they, this is just a means to an end, you know, they don't really enjoy the job itself. It is a job they're doing just to earn some money. But we need to be fulfilled, not just working for an end. So we have to ask ourselves, what, what does it mean to be fulfilled then? And so fulfillment can be summed up as uh, when you were a baby, you had to cry to be able to get what you want. 
And if you didn't, your parents probably thought you didn't want it or need it. So you didn't get it. The same applies when you grow up. See, the world doesn't just hand you what you want unless you ask for it and work for it. Oh, that might surprise some people. See, because once we ask for it, we have to work to be able to get it. And as we work for it, and we see that we are earning that, we get a sense of fulfillment from it. Oh, yeah. So, in order to be fulfilled, we need to have a purpose in mind and an end game in sight. We need to have a purpose in mind and an end game in sight. Then you focus, instead of just on the material thing, you're focusing on that accomplishment, what you actually did. And see, by doing that, it makes us feel fulfilled. It's not just after a material thing, such as money, but it's after that accomplishment. It's after feeling good about something you did. And it builds up your self-worth. And when you build up your self-worth, it builds up your attitude. And when it builds up your attitude, it changes your outlook on everything that you do. So in order to have that positive outlook so we can whistle while we come to work, we have to understand that we need to have our focus on our accomplishments and have an end game in sight. We have to have that purpose. And that's really what Bezalel and Aholiab and the other craftsmen had in that story was they were anointed by God and they were given this humongous list of things to do and surely to them it probably was overwhelming but through the power of God working within them through him anointing them they were able to see past this daunting task and they were able to do and accomplish the work that was set before them and that's really the way we have to look at it too we have to ask for that anointing of God's spirit upon us as we go to that workplace each and every day to be able to have the fulfillment, that sense of accomplishment that will carry our attitude throughout not only our work day, but as we come home at night. And that's really, really part, a very, very foundational part of having a fulfilled life. Well, see, the same thing can be said about our church life. We need to have a purpose. And we need to know that we are bar part of a bigger plan and that God has anointed what we are doing. But how do we discern that what we are doing is gifted from God? Ooh, there's a one. That might trip us up a little bit. Well, if we look back in the scripture today, in the case of the workers, and their story in Exodus, they were given three dimensions of discerning that giftedness. And the first one was divine initiative. They were called by name. They were set out apart from the others. So they were called by name. And you're going, well, gee, God's never called me by name for anything. But you don't really know that's true. And I'll get to that in a moment as well. So the second thing they had was they had a heart's desire. So they had a purpose in mind. They were given those gifts, those things. And so they went in there and they had a heart's desire to actually do the work. They wanted to do it. They were motivated to get the job done. And see, that's really, really important as well. So these three things are very, very key. Third thing was recognition by the community. Now, in this case, Moses identified the workers and commissioned them to do the work of building the tent and the tabernacle and all the furnishings of the tabernacle. And in our lives today, our work lives today, we have to look for those things as well. So I'd like to share you one story of why this is important for our vocational development ourselves and our discernment that we need to have as we go through our work day to day. So at work, I was headed up, or chosen to head up a project for our vice president of service. 
And I was chosen for the job because he had seen some of my other work that I had done for Labco before we were purchased by Waldinger Corporation. And so what he did is he hoped that I could do the same improvements for his service department as well. Now that expands a little bit because we have 14 other locations that he's in charge of himself, and that's just in that division. So he put me in touch with the department head so that I could discern how my programs would fit within their programs to be able to accomplish the bigger task. And each week we meet by Zoom meeting now because we can't meet in person. Uh, that and he's in Kansas City and I'm in Cedar Rapids, so that has a little bit of distance separation. And I review what I've developed so far in that session that we had. And then we work together to fine tune what I've done so that it works into what he has envisioned for his departments as well to be spread across all the different departments. And at the end of the, each meeting, what I think is really, really special is he validates my work and thanks me for the efforts. Now, I have to admit, when he does this, it definitely gives you that motivation to carry on and do that job and press forward, because that's a daunting task. This has never been done before. There's no book I can go to to look it up. I could develop all this from scratch. I'm just kind of going off of what he told me his points were that he wanted to do. So I have to come up with this completely from scratch. So there's no Googling it and saying, how can I do this? Because it doesn't exist. But it motivates me because when I started this, it was a very daunting task. I was going, okay, you have a lot of different variations and components and things like that that you want me to engineer out for you to make sure it will work. But you know, when your work is validated and they thank you for the work that they do, that you do on their behalf, it motivates you to do more and better work. It raises that attitude right up. So when we feel empowered and validated, it goes to our very soul to do the best that we can do, whatever the job is. So how do we see God and others validating our work as we go through? That's a question I'd really like you to reflect on this next week. How do we see God and others validating our work? So when we're serving God by serving others, we can feel that spirit of God within us, working in us, and we feel joy. We feel true joy. That blessing. Do we take the time to recognize that? that we feel that joy as we're helping others. That's one of the blessings. That's of God validating your work. And you have to understand at that point in time, you are then understanding that you've been anointed by God to do that work. It may seem menial, the task that you're doing, but it doesn't make a difference. No matter how big or small the task is, God anointed you to do the task should make you feel special and empowered. Sound familiar? We just need to take the time to recognize God working within our lives. So I'd like you to think back to a time when you had this happen, when you were having that feeling of working for God. Think back to a time when you did something and how it made you feel. How did it make the others feel that you were doing the work for? Did it make you feel empowered? Motivated to do more? It gets you excited to be able to go out and do those kind of things. And I know that in some of the things that I do, I just can't wait to, to the next task to be able to do it. And sometimes God places us in work situations that we have to understand can only be termed as contentious at best. Um, and for the life of us, we can't fathom what we did to deserve having to work there. 
I know I've been in that situation before. It's not pleasant. It's hard to come to work with a positive attitude. And it's really tough, even tougher, to go home after that day if you're faced with these kind of problems you face. But see, that might just be the point. God is placing us there not for our benefit, but for someone else's. See, God still anointed us. God still gave us this task. And it says in the scriptures that he's never going to give us anything that we cannot do with Christ strengthening us. Wow. But see, we might be the only Christian example for others in that workplace. He places us, he chose us to be there to lift up and edify someone else. It could be a calling for them to come home. They may have been lost for a long time. And by your Christian example of what you do and how you act in that workplace, it might be the only Christian example they get to see. But see, if we face that with adversity, we face that situation that we have to go into, and we do it with a smile, might be just the motivation those other people need to say, hey, how can you do this and work here and be so happy? And that gives you the opportunity to share. It opens up that opportunity for you to share with those people about your Christian life. So you, do you face work with the face of Christ? Or do you do it with defeat? Others are looking at you as an example of a Christian. I'm sure they know you're a Christian. That's hard not to in the workplace. So they're looking at you to say, okay, if you're a Christian, how come I hear all this blue language? Hmm. Pretty shallow faith. So we have to think about those kind of things coming through. Others are going to look at us and try and figure out exactly who we are as Christians, but if we do it with happiness, with a smile on our face, no matter how daunting the task is, they're going to see there's something more to your life, and they would love to have it a part of theirs as well. So Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, and because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Wow. That's pretty powerful. So... We have to take a look at the adversities that we face in our workplace, and we have to do it with a smile on our face because they help us endure as we go through. We now have a new purpose in life. And see, when we do that, we have that persistence to make it through, then that develops our character, and our character strengthens our hope of salvation. We have the promises of God to fall back on to lift us up and to edify us in that situation. Likewise, in James 1, 2 through 4, we hear another example of how we need to face the challenges that are put in our path. And we need to do it with persistence and endurance. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So what James is saying here is that if we were patient in a given situation, if we show persistence and we endure that, what we are facing with joy, then we are going to be blessed with fulfillment. It's another way that we have to look at it is the trials that we have in life 
are actually helping us to live a fulfilled life through the promises of God. So let it grow when your endurance is fully developed. You will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Amazing. He goes on to say this in chapter 2, verse 18. Now someone may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. He's stating here that we not only need to have faith in God's plan, but we actually need to work that plan out in our lives. Serving others, showing love instead of disdain. Be an example of the living Christ for others so they may come to want what we have and know what we know as Christians. So as I come to our conclusion today, I have a couple of rhetorical questions for you. Are we showing the Spirit of God in our workplace? Are we living out Christ for our coworkers? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to guide our hearts and minds to do what God asked us to do today, just like Bezalel and Oholiab did back then? Think about it. If the answers aren't what you think they should be, that's probably why you don't have the fulfilled life that God wants for you. But see, only you can answer these questions. Only you can have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God that will lead you to that fulfilled life. Let's pray. Lord God, you've sent us into the world to spread the gospel about your kingdom. Father, I know that part of my job at my workplace is to spread the message of Jesus Christ. So I ask today that you would fill us with boldness to talk about your son Jesus with our colleagues. Let them see Jesus in me and the way that I talk and work and treat others. Help me to be slow to speak and slow to anger and quick to listen. Help me to be a faithful witness of Christ at the office that people may see that I serve a true and living God. In Jesus' name, I believe. message that even though we might not be working in our businesses, working from home is very poignant in this time. As I think about communion this morning and I think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, I'm drawn right back to uh, the beginning of uh, Psalm 107 where, where Pastor Mark had chosen for our call to worship this morning. I want to just read the, the first few verses of this because listen to the, the words uh, fully here. It says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. For he has gathered the exiles from many lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the wilderness, lost and homeless. Hungry and thirsty, they nearly died. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble. And he rescued them from their distress. He led them straight to safety, to a city where they could live. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. God's word has so many meanings. It had a meaning for the people that the psalmist was writing for then, but it has a meaning for us now. We need to be thankful. We need to, being in God's presence, want to share at work, at home, when we're masked up and we're at the grocery store. We need to share. But it talks about our distress, and I, and I, I go back and I, say, I keep seeing that graphic that Mark created and put up for the, the sermon today. And I keep seeing those people. And 
you know, in here it talks about wandering in the, in the wilderness. It talks about being hungry and thirsty. It talks about the people crying out to God. And as a people, we're crying out to God right now for the things that we're going through. And he leads us to safety. And, and when I come into context of, of this meal, this is God leading us to that new city. This is God leading us to heaven, to an eternity with him. So as, as we take our communion today, as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, I want you to think about these things, that he led them to safety, to where a city where they could live, heaven. Let them praise the Lord for his great love, a love greater than we can all understand, because he satisfies. And we are reminded of this. Just as Jesus did with his disciples, he broke the bread on that night that he was betrayed. He said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And then a little later in the meal, he picked up the cup and he filled it. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. And we are reminded as often as we eat of this bread and drink this cup, that we are to do so until the Lord returns. Now, out of an abundance of costume, we are not doing intinction uh, for communion right now, but we are using the cups. And if you're new here, you just, there's two layers. You wanna open up and get to the wafer of the body, and then you can open up and get to the juice. If you're joining us online and you want to join us each week in taking communion, please reach out to us. We would be more than happy to deliver a supply of these to you so that each week you can join us in communion. Join us now. The body. Father, thank you for this meal. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love, for guarding us and watching over us, and for helping us in all situations. And as part, Pastor Mark was telling us today, the words that you gave him, that we can do this at work, we can go with joy, in knowing that when we go to work, we're bringing glory to you. Thank you, Father, for what this meal represents and what, it will, what we will eventually get to see, which is you. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Denise, would you like to come up? Okay, now's our time for agape time. If um, anybody has a God sighting this week they'd like to share or a um, uh, happiness that that's happened in their life this week or anyone they need prayer for I'm, I'm, I'd be glad to pray for them so does anybody have anything they'd like to share okay Mark well I had the opportunity to um, share with them, some of the fellow employees one of our co-workers in here um, who is struggling with some problems in his family right now I had the opportunity to share with him and to pray with him person who I would never have thought that I'd be able to share and pray with. And uh, I think he's really taking it to heart and gives him something to think about. Uh, and then secondly, the family that we've been praying about, uh, another co-worker there, um, she lost her brother last Thursday. And uh, so they had the funeral on Monday. And then yesterday, or I'm sorry, Friday, she told me that she lost her uncle that Friday morning. We need to lift up the Funk family and, okay. and the, okay. the loss that they've endured two weeks in a row. So. Okay. Okay. All right. And I just wanted to, did you have something? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to thank you and uh, Terry for the service this weekend and for our Bible studies. Um, they have really blessed me. For I have been struggling also with anxiety. I don't know if anybody else has. Um, we have family members that are ill. And of course we go to work every day and then we're facing a pandemic, you know, so I think 
sometimes it's it's a female thing that you, you get that worry in your heart and it's hard to let it go. You let it go at the foot of the cross or you try to and then you bring it back. So I just want to pray for that because, you know, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And I just want to share that with you. So um, I just want to lift everyone up in prayer this morning. Lord God, I pray that you will be with the Funk family. You will comfort their hearts and be with them through their trials as they go forward in their lives without their loved ones. Be with them and just um, help them through each day. And help them to know that you are God and to have faith that you have every foot um, and every, everything in their life already formed. Everything that they do, you are already there going ahead of them to give them strength. So Jesus, I ask this for um, everyone who's suffering, and um, I pray for Steve's brother, Larry, who's facing cancer, and I pray for his mom, who's facing a, um, a back injury, and I just pray that you will comfort them and bring people around them, bring people in their lives that will help them through this, Lord Jesus, for we are far away from them, and it's hard we cannot be there. So I pray for people that are struggling with anxiety, and I just pray that God gives you comfort and peace in your heart, for he is the way maker, he is the miracle worker, he is a promise keeper, and he is your light in the darkness, and he is my light in the darkness. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us so faithfully. In Jesus' holy name, amen. This does conclude uh, our online service. Um, for those of you that are with us in person, uh, we will have a time of music. But for those of you that are online, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you all next week.